Werewolf the podcast, welcome to episode 157. We've been away in Berlin, so we're back now and we're going to carry on with the story of the Professor, Will, Fenn, devils and gods and vampires and stuff so hopefully you've listened to all the previous episodes in the series otherwise this may be a little difficult to understand thanks to all those that are supporting the show it just means that we can get better equipment and we can have a a sort of nicer time doing it if we can actually pay for food and stuff so support us by buying us a coffee the link is in the description you can also join the facebook group there you can meet me on insta you can meet me on twitter you can meet me i don't know on tiktok and all those kind of trendy social media places um if you could review us that would be fantastic you just click up and put a five star review in you don't even have to write anything on spotify uh that would be wonderful and above all else remember we love you she sits at a desk in the very bowels of hell that is how it's always described isn't it you know the the bowels of hell i mean it's It's not a great description, really, is it? Can you imagine what the bowels of hell are like? Most of us have had the results of that 3 a.m. kebab, have we not? The four days of food poisoning that accompany that. Are we imagining the colon on the first day or on the fourth day? There would be a, a real significant difference between those days, would there not? And to be honest, I don't want to describe that either. I mean, the bowels, not necessarily the bowels of hell pretty horrendous anyway the place she sat is not dark tight and um shitty (laughs) this is her sanctum and she's its only visitor so she can have it however her mind wants she's not actually going to be inside a colon is she not a a fallen angel of this quality although i do hear she has some um extreme tastes anyway Today, she is in a yurt taken from the plains of Mongolia in the 1200s. Well, almost exactly like one, but it's minus the smell of horses and horse shit. See? No shit, classy lady. Sorry, I I seem to be a bit focused on the shit. In fact, it's not a yurt, it's a gur, which is what the Mongols called what the Russians called yurts. But let's not push too hard for semantic accuracy. It's a big tenty thing from the steppe. It's traditional looking on the inside. The stove is in the centre. There is a male half and a female half of the yurt, uh, um, Gur. I don't think the Mongols had issues with gender identification, judging by this place. Having said that, you know that it's all uh, traditional stuff. There are things like proper lights. Probably not electric lights, but like magic ones that look electric and stuff. I know it's weird. This yurt, I mean, Erg, is at the 10th level of hell I know I know they're not supposed to be more than nine levels of hell but hey this is a secret spot that only the devil can reach so why would anyone but her know about it in fact my description of it here has got her staring at me as the narrator as if I was some kind of well nosy bastard or stalker and that stare is making me feel uncomfortable so let's continue with the story and stop this description of this place of nonsense She looks away from the eyes of my imagination and back to her screen. Above her are the nine levels of hell and the city of Pandemonium itself, the demon city. I don't know either how they're above her and things, but I just know it's um, it's that religion-y stuff in it and magic and make you up bollocks. So somehow this whole thing seems to work well. The nine levels above and the city of Pandemonium are where those who feel guilty are rewarded with pain for their sins on earth. You know, the usual shit. If you feel bad about your actions, you'll end up here. Funnily enough, if you feel good about the things that you did that were horrible, then you don't tend to end up here. Hence the lack of some real bastards from hell through history who genuinely did not feel guilty about the things they did. Let's look for someone proper evil. Is there anyone proper evil? Oh, come on. (laughs) It has to be the cliché. It has to be Hitler we look for, does it not? I mean, he is the go-to for every writer when it comes to an evil bloke from recent history. Although, we do have a lot to choose from if you think about it. Hitler is not here in hell. 
Uh huh. He's not even in heaven either, so where the fuck is he? Oh yeah, maybe it's that conspiracy thing and he's with the rest of them German bastards somewhere in Argentina. Maybe. But he should be dead by now, though, shouldn't he? Should he not? Just let me Google his birth date. 1889. So how old is he? He's 135 years old or something like that. God damn, he must be dead. I don't think even Hitler... Had, well, maybe he doesn't want to die. I don't know. It's, a, it's what, what it is. Oh, uh, get on with it. Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. Whew. She sits before the brand new MacBook Pro. It's not a real MacBook Pro. This one is everything the MacBook Pro promises because a brilliant mind, hers, has created it in that moment. She's been sitting here staring at the screen for some time. In hell there is only... Sometime? Sounds like the tagline of a shit movie, doesn't it? In hell there is only sometime. Time does not pass in the usual relative way that it does when we involve physics and theories and that kind of stuff and whatever. This is her world, her creation, so time just passes as she wants. So to her it could have been hours, days, millennia or seconds and honestly it doesn't matter to her. She will be here until the end of time and she was here at the beginning. Because of the lack of relativity in her life, she has also seen the end of time. She holds a promise of the things to come. She does have a lot to do before that time comes, so she sits at the desk and plays with the mortals of the world. No, not all of them, that'd be dead boring. She is a hunter of only those that matter, those that stand out from the crowd. She does not care for the souls of the, how do we say it, um, standard mortal. They typically morally corrupt themselves and end up hers anyway. I mean, it's what you're told to do, isn't it? Really, is it not? You cannot live without sin, so most of the faithful know where they're going to, you know, end up anyway. So she has no work to put in to get them here. Basically, if you're born and you think you should go to hell, you go. Fucked up, really, if you think about it. How would Leibniz explain that conundrum? Well, he probably wouldn't. He's here if you want to ask him. She tells me with a wink and a smile. When I see Lucifer in my mind's eye, her pronoun, her pronoun, her pronoun, her pronoun, her pronoun, those things, are she or her. The point of that sentence is the bit where I said when I, me, see her. When you see her, um, it could be any pronoun, including the pronoun it. If it is a pronoun, I'm not sure. It depends on what you truly desire. That is what she represents. Your true temptation. She is the thing that can lead us from the path of righteousness. If you've ever been on it. She can be, for example, addiction in some people's cases. She can be hate in others. Mostly, though, she represents an individual. That individual that sits in your head as your deal breaker. The one that would have you turn your back on all else just to be noticed by um, it. To be loved by it. Although, she does not know what love is. Or does she? Gosh. This saying thing is something really complicated if you think about it. So it's probably a lot better not to think about it very... Get on with it. Sorry, sorry, I get sidetracked a little bit every now and again. It's just part of the story. She, as mentioned, is the devil. Throughout our stories, she has been referred to as Lucy. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was clever, you know, like shortening of the obvious Lucifer to Lucy, but only recently have I found out that the same thing's been done about a thousand times before. But that is the nature of writing. Original thought is truly rare. Even if you believe it is original thought, it ain't. I thought I'd been clever. And in reality, I had until lots of you guys out there pointed it out. You know, that had the same idea as other writers. But thanks for making me feel unremarkable in my musings. For goodness sake, the plot. Sorry, sorry. Okay, let's escape this writer's innate ramblings and focus on what she, Lucifer, Lucy, Beelzebub, the devil, is doing. 
She's written several ideas of how this story will conclude. Will end well. Will end-ish. Like all good authors, she's cut the 23 ideas down to a decent six that she thinks would be fun. She unluckily for her has all the editors that have ever lived and died to hand to help in hell. All editors end up in hell. Sorry if that is a shock, but in fact it's true. In fact, telling me I cannot use in fact in my prose is what in fact got you there. In fact. <clears throat> As the true manipulator, she... The devil, Lucifer Morningstar, will choose the outcome of our little series that we're progressing through so far. Uh, well, it's not a short little series at all, is it? It's got to 32 parts and it seems to be never ending, but she's going to choose the end. It makes it easier for me, to be honest, if the devil does it. Maybe she won't pick on me so much. Each of the six endings has its own part of fun and sadness built in. Lucifer could choose to get her dose of emotional turmoil from any of the hundreds of soap operas out there, but the Great Destroyer would prefer to destroy and play with real people and steal their souls. I mean, that's what we want, isn't it? All of us. Really? I mean, well, maybe not the souls, but... An emotional tornado of a type as an ending... Fuck a happily ever after. That's not real. Happily ever after means that things end, but they don't end in real life. But just go on. Life goes on after yours is even done. You are still a part of life until you are forgotten by others. You don't end, you just fade away. Here are the six endings that she has to choose from. And to be honest, she's struggling. She's struggling to decide which is the least appropriate. Number one, Will Will. Will Will? Is that a good... Uh, uh, will Will the werewolf come out on top? Number two, Will the professor win? Number three, Will Sally come back and do all the killing and stuff and come out on top? Number four, Will Sammy and her son rule the day? Number five, Will God in his heaven and that goddamn goon Gabriel win the day? Or number six, Will they all lose? That's a bit of a cop out on her part, but I'm, I'm, I'm not telling her shit. I just said it out loud. Nice. It works out as six possible endings. She could just choose she could just decide the ending but the actual ending is that she will be the winner whatever lucy will always be the winner you can throw the angel out of heaven into the pit but she will still sit there and rule the world she gets humans a lot more than their creator the old man up, you know got upstairs because she's changed them forever to her ways a bit of a satanic snake sedition meant that the likely place for all souls is in hell. Or do you believe that God is all-powerful and that he knew what would happen and, and just let it? The sedition, I mean. <sighs> for God's sake, can you imagine making up a religion? It must be so difficult, eh? Bringing the plot of this little podcast together is enough of a nightmare, and there have been two of us doing it. God created all this, I mean this... I can't show you the what I'm pointing at, but I mean everything, by himself. Why then is God a little shit at knowing humans, you may momentarily ask. Well, you might not, I don't know. Well, God cares too much about these little human things. He looks after them all in his own way. You might think that is bullshit because shit things happen to nice people and, and other quaint sayings along those lines. But good and evil have to exist in the world for you to be able to use the freedom of choice that he's given you. Yeah, I know, some great philosopher said that. And it's probably true or probably not or probably who cares. What would be the point in deciding your path if there was only one path to follow? You have to choose to be a good person or a naughty person. In order to choose to be a good person, life has to show you the shit of the world and you and others need to suffer at times. Life is not fair and her and his definitions of what that simple statement means are very different. And when I say her and his, I mean Lucifer and God's. According to God, 
life is not fair, so everyone can see the best and the worst of life and choose to be good or evil. Even those going through the shittiest of times, as long as they have faith in the Lord, will get a just reward when they grow their enormous feathery wings and fly into the sky. Aye, that is where heaven is apparently, up in the sky. What does life is not fair mean to the devil? To her it's just that life isn't fair and if you're on the wrong side of that then tough shit. Fucking deal with it. Tough titties and all that. God got you to choose to be the loser. Deal with it. Oh, sorry, I need to actually start telling the story, don't I? Where was I? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she sits at a desk in her office floor on, on the bottom of the ten rings of hell. She sips an espresso and mulls over the six outcomes. And is getting super irritated with you getting to the point... Look, I'm really sorry. I'm just scene setting and all that. That's me job. Hmm. Which of the six was she going to choose? Which of the six outcomes was she going to foster? Hmm. All of them would be fun. A sparkle of an idea lights up in her devilish mind, and a six-sided die made from the femur of a 14th century leper lands before her on the table. What? Why a leper? Yeesh. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry, I, I have no idea why I tied that level of detail to the die's description, but that is what the die is made from. I mean, you're the devil, it, it couldn't just be a like you know a piece of cheap crappy plastic, could it? There would be no sort of ominous evil in the fact that it was taken out of your monopoly box, would it? I suppose. She smiles as she lifts the said die and places it on the most luscious pair of red painted lips that have ever touched a leper's thigh. She gives the six-sided dice a little smoochy kiss and lets it roll. What? No. Yeah, it was going too far. Sorry. Strike the two last sentences from the public record, please. Better. The die spins for an inordinate amount of time, eventually spinning for far too long on one little corner of the cube. Physics. Schmizics. Then it falls and settles. Ah, of course. Why not? She says out loud as the number comes up to be shown. It is, of course, seven. Well, the lull in the battle as the giant blood god's bodyguards had been killed by demon soldiers, hellfire and, <laughs> of course, the kittens of doom. Yeah, yeah, you heard that right. Killed by the kittens of doom. I promise the last episode is worth listening to. The Kittens of Doom were particularly great, cute, deadly. Yeah, well, this lull meant that I could run in my wolf form to where Bosworth and the Professor were stood. There was much discussion going on between them, and it genuinely seemed that they were laying plans about the upcoming battle with the gods. Well, that's what I thought as I arrived, but it turns out that they weren't talking plans for the forthcoming fight, but seemed to be discussing the latest cricket results for something called... The ashes, and the fact that some bowler was called holding and some batter was called balls. I suppose it's a joke for those writers amongst you or those that are semantic professionals. Write down the following sentence and punctuate it. Are you ready? Have you got a pen, piece of paper, computer? Write this down and punctuate it correctly. The bowler is holding the batter's balls. Yep, you get the level of hilarity that incorrect punctuation can bring to a thing. Because the name of the bowler is holding, and the name of the batter is balls. Yeah, did you get it right? I hope not. Hey up, lad, how's they doing? Said Bosworth. Oh, sorry, I better tell you who Bosworth is if you've not listened to the other episodes. He is the landlord of a pub on the edges of reality and the supernatural realms. No, no, you're picturing the wrong idea of him, the, the wrong thing. He's not a little semi-bald figure in a stained polo shirt. He's in fact a retired gin, um, genie person. He's been around for millennia and, and got sick of granting wishes. 
I mean, if you think about it, they get to be a bit repetitive after a while in, you know, in what people wish for. It had got boring for him, so he did what seemed like the thing that retirees do and built a, a dimension of his own to stick the village of Phaeton and his bar and hotel in. This was the place that had karaoke, an unhappy and a happy hour, and a bar fight on a nightly schedule. It was also the favourite port of call for all those of, you know, cryptid or magical mindsets. He is a large neon pink robe that is full of a dark shadow that you can but cannot see and stuff. Across the back of the unordinary glowy robe is Bosworth written in even pinker and even glowier writing <sighs> oh now I need to describe the fucking professor don't I? right y you've listened to 30 episodes hopefully so you you've got the idea of what the professor is I'm just gonna so I'm gonna shorten it down the professor is a 13th century immortal knight you should know who he is by now and I really hope you do he's a, a great character hey up oh, lad yeah that's where we are sorry it's Point what Bosworth talked to me, I had to do the thing, yeah. The professor nodded a curt nod. He was wearing his plate armour, so I could not see his face, because he had his helmet on. So I assumed that this was a, a sort of hello of a kind. As I was saying, old chap, Anderson's getting on a bit, don't you think? I mean, he's a good player, but his averages are well down. Uh, I, I feel bad for the chap, I really do. But he needs to think about what's best for the team and call it quits himself, in my humble opinion. You know, go out on past highs. Uh, I mean, it's sad to see a sportsman fade after such a bloody good career, huh? A blade of energy had been sent from the tip of Sammy's Sutton's sword. It blew us all off our feet and onto the floor. Not that Bosworth had feet, but if he'd have had feet, he'd have been blown off it. And Anyway, my body's muscles were suddenly locked in a spasm i was pinned to the floor and it was it, if this had been a video game my player's energy bar would have took a solid hit and would be still going down as the vampiric vampiric or vamp prick <laughs> suits him more vampiric fucktar giant stole energy from my body my wolf face was pinned to the floor but i could see the big fuck and the fact that he was absorbing our essence and growing in size he was feeding on us and he was getting stronger well this is not bloody cricket said the poor prone professor lying on his back in a star shape looking at the now wrath-filled sky bosworth was the first to raise himself from the ground and a, a wave of neon pink energy blasted from the robe's empty arms at the giant's gianty giant guy the wave, whatever it was, coated his armour as if it was um, uh, pink glowy wallpaper paste. I know, I know, I could have provided a better description than that, but I think you can sort of grasp that as an image, can't you? The pink slimy splurge solidified and the magical draining of our vital life juice stopped. At this key moment, Fen came into mind. He had a plan, a plan that I could easily understand and undertake. Right, lad, let's fuck him up, Will. So I charged. The professor was now in close combat with Sammy. The clash of metal on metal rang out over the howling of the winds around us. As I ran at full pace, I changed from a wolf form into a werewolf form. I loved this body. It was designed and... I not designed, um, evolved. No, it's not really evolved, is it? Because it's uh, um, magic for one thing, and that was for killing and ripping things up. I didn't slow my pace as I got closer to him. I got faster and faster as I was ready to hit the giant with all I had. With ten feet to go, I leapt. Paws, feet, and claws, and teeth are ready to strike his torso and start to shred armour and flesh before he could respond. My jaws were going to take him at the throat. I was going to down my enemy and then dismember him in front of his mother. I would really enjoy this. I would really enjoy it a lot. As I struck the god's chest, the pink coating shattered like glass. No, it's... It really wasn't like glass, was it? It was more like... Do you know when you beat it, when you bite like a toffee apple and it's got that crisp outer coating, 
yeah, like a sweet candy coating. Oh, you do know what I mean. A coating that contains a, a luscious fruity centre in both cases. <laughs> by the magic work by the genie or by the fact that it was really shit, the chest plate of his armour shattered with the strike as well. I landed all four of my limbs squarely on his sternum and with my momentum he lost his footing and slid on his back with me standing on him like some, I don't know, shit golden surfboard through the turf. His mass broke the ground as he slid. My claws buried themselves in his revealed flesh as he slid. My teeth enveloped his helmet as he slid. And by the time he came to a stop, his chest was now open to the sky. Bits flew from it as I dug my way from his front through to his back. A childlike scream left the helmet that I held in my jaws. The noise was really disconcerting. A thing like this should not make that kind of noise. The giant stopped moving. It was dead. Um, uh, undead, dead, deaded, killed, slain, or whatever the undead are when they've been murdered. I don't know. A scream shattered the air. Sammy had seen her child fall and for a moment had dropped her guard through the lack of concentration. Simon took his opportunity and swiped his sword across the back of her legs, hamstringing her. She fell to her knees, still reaching and screaming for her son. She did nothing to stop Simon from thrusting his sword point down between the gap between a gorget of her neck and the chest armour until the hilt stopped the insertion with the blade at full depth in her body. Her eyes held no notice or recognition of the fact that she had just been probably cut and killed. Tears were there as she cried and stared at the shredded red mess that was her son. I let her see me start to literally enjoy wolfing down the offal of my victim. I kept my eyes on her. I kept eating. Blood ran into my black fur, as did little gobbets of flesh as I ripped and swallowed in each bite. Burn my fucking house down, bitch, would you? I thought as I destroyed the only thing that mattered to her. Fuck's sake, how pathetic. Look, you can make more children, but you can't remake a classic E-type jag, could you? Nah, they're one of a kind and you burnt the fucker. Her head dropped as the professor withdrew the sword with some, with some difficulty, to be honest. She was now on her knees, on her butt, eyes closed and quiet. Inside, Fen and I reveled in our moment of revenge. The retribution was fun. I had taken her most important thing. I'd killed it while she watched. I would take his head and helmet as a trophy. I would take it and show it to her. <laughs> I turned to my downed opponent and moved to the head and reached for the visor. I wanted to see the face of my enemy. Hopefully, hopefully, I would get to enjoy the last few moments of his death with him. I could look into those eyes and watch him fade. I could see those eyes dim and watch that body fail. I undid the clip that held the visor closed deftly with a claw tip finger. I then raised the visor to reveal the monster's face. It was, uh, that was a bit of a shock. It was, um, was, well, it was the face of a young child. It was the face of a a toddler, a, a face that shouldn't be there. I shook my furry head to try and clear the glamour that must have obviously created this in my mind. The giant kid was still alive. It it looked rather confused and hurt. It, I don't think it could comprehend what was happening shit is this where they got the idea of Mad Max be beyond the Thunderdome master and blaster from or was it that I just stole it from them who knows mama it gurgled as blood flowed from its mouth and nose of course <laughs> of course and then it died a god died I had killed a god Brilliant light formed in the chest of the corpse. I had to literally cover my eyes, it was so bright. The night went still, and the little ball got brighter 
and brighter as I watched. The light sizzled and shook, and then with a boom it flew into the firmament above, where it formed a new star. Well, that was proper god dying shit, I suppose. You die as a god, and you create a star. Sammy screamed. Oh, how she screamed. Oh, it made me feel so good. She wasn't screaming from the pain of her wounds. She wasn't screaming from the loss of the battle. The scream was from the mother's loss of her baby. Oh, how the hair stood on the back of my neck. Oh, how I enjoyed the pain that she felt. Fucking bitch. You will live on. You will be back, my son. Star for now, we will be back. The dead giant was strangely still now. I know it's dead, so it should be still, but it it had had so much life and so much energy, and it was just now an empty husk. I kicked it just to make sure and did it in front of Sammy, so she cried out again, you know. I like that. The fact that I could hurt her so easily. So because I'm a bit of a dick, I kicked it again a few times just for shits and giggles. At this point, the professor stood by me looking down on the now complex mess that had been created. He seemed not to be worried about Sammy anymore. I think he realised that Sammy was going nowhere with the level of damage that had been inflicted. Well, was it physical damage that held her there? Or maybe it was just the that he knew that she was so emotionally damaged that she was unable to do anything but, like, grieve. Ah, yes. You can see the gene pool wasn't too deep there. He nodded at the face of the dead body. I sort of, like, nodded my agreement. Hmm. In this case, rogering and reproducing with your brother does not produce a good outcome. I smiled. He wasn't kidding. He certainly wasn't. I looked at Sammy's now pathetic figure. (laughs) This was my time to have fun with her now. This was the time to be cruel and sadistic. This was the time to torture and to hurt, to ruin and commit my rage on her. This would be fun. (laughs) Fen and I separated and he waited over at the corpse as I wandered with the professor back to the kneeling, bleeding, crying God. You okay? I asked her. I know, I know, it was a dick move to ask her that, but I realised that I'm not a nice werewolf, so being a dick comes very easily to me. She was... She was still on her knees and just about holding herself up from falling to the floor, but her head was still at my height as she knelt. She was a... a lot bigger than I remember. Sammy, I killed your brother. And now I've killed your kid. (laughs) How does that make you feel? I asked her, an element of mirth in my tone. She lifted her head slowly and looked at me, her red orbs of eyes full of tears, yet yet unable to allow expression of her pain, but the, the power of her suddenly applied glamour slammed into me. For a moment, I fought, but I reached towards the professor's dagger at his belt, an image in my head of sinking it into my own throat. It was the only thing to do. I fought it. Whoa there, old chap! Shouted the professor, slapping at my reaching hand as he kicked Sammy, breaking her control. Remember, remember, the vampire's got a temper. (laughs) He sort of sing-songed at me, which was really weird. But then I realised that he was trying to sort of distract me from the glamour. I shook my head and brought myself back to the moment and back into control. But now, now I was really pissed off at the moment of lack of control and and I just had to do something about it. I reached for that tear-stained, beautiful face, cupping the chin of her to, to make, make them look into my eyes. Where... And what did you do with Sally? I asked her nicely. She looked back at me but was silent. And she obviously had confusion on her face. I I grabbed her now by the throat, a little roughly. And the woman's gasp of shock was a little distracting in a 
weirdly sexual way. More glamour? I asked her again. Where and what did you do with Sally? I said, shaking her. I don't understand the question. Sammy told me. Bosworth now floated up to join our little group. You did something with Sally and Malcolm. You you done something with them. You you sent me a package. I paused weirdly and against my usual expectations a lump a lump formed in my throat a, a feeling um in my head in my heart. I I was concerned and feeling um an emotion. Sammy shook her head in response. That was nothing to do with me. She spat. This made me angry. She'd... She'd fucking killed them. She'd killed the... The babe... The babe... The, the progeny in Sally's belly and... And then fucking skinned them and then... She'd sent those pen... Those pelts, those little... Things to me and... I tried to get more control of myself. I, I really did, but the energy built inside me and I lost it a little. I slapped her across the face with everything that I had. She collapsed to the floor in a pile. I literally had to shake my hand out. It stung with so much pain. God. That was an unexpected result. Hitting Sammy had been like striking solid steel. On the ground, she laughed. I did not do anything to Sally. I quite like her. I did not send you a package. It's not my style to send a package. If I had killed them, hmm, I would have, yes, ripped Sally apart in front of you to get your reaction. I would have torn her belly first to expose the young in the womb, and then I would have given your stillborn children back to you and I would have done it all laughing at the pathetic lack of a response from you she chuckled at this I mean it was an actual <laughs> chuckle vampire queens shouldn't shouldn't chuckle it doesn't suit them to be honest my temper cracked she got the rise out of me and she was and it was what she was pushing for and I went to kick her on the floor. The professor stopped me by holding my shoulder. I, I was raging at him now. Just just for that moment, but when I looked at him he he shook his head and motioned with his eyes and a nod to something behind me. I turned. Of course it was her. <laughs> of course she was. It was Lucifer. The beautiful beastly bitch was standing smiling and giving us a little wave. Fuck! Have you thought that it may have been her? Sammy laughed, lying in her prone position. Have you noticed that she seems to be taking a great deal of interest in what is happening? Why is that, do you not wonder? Her voice cracked again with distress. I looked at Lucy, who shrugged her shoulders and offered a, a half-smile as a response. The professor coughed, broke the tension, and then spoke. It seemed a, a strangely polite thing to do in a moment such as this. I believe Sammy will. I really do. Tell you what, though. How much do you wish to know the real answer? Hmm? I looked at him, and he could tell from my expression how much I wanted to know. He raised his arms, his body language asking me to calm down. Sammy slowly raised herself to her knees again from the ground. The ground that was was soaked, was covered in a pool of sticky, coagulating blood. Mm. You see, Lucy over there is a jealous person. She cannot stand the idea that Gabriel and I had a brief fling. A very brief fling. Sammy continued. She closed her eyes and moaned and then looked to the heavens. Gabriel! Was the word she vomited from her mouth. 
I know, I know, a weird description of someone saying something, but the word to describe how that word was said is truly vomited. A stark, bright light fell from the sky and stopped dead about three feet from the floor. With the tiniest of pings, Gabriel appeared. I am Gabriel, Archangel. I am here to help, to forgive and to lead you to the truth, he said raising his hands and taking, well, a very overly dramatic pose. I think it took a while for him to register all the things that had happened around him. Well, not happened around him, but had happened, I suppose, in that moment. His dramatic pose was held as his eyes flashed from individual to individual present and the mess and the destruction. His eyes rested on Lucy for a little while, and then he moved to Sammy. Oh, shit, was his very unangelic comment. His dramatic pose turned from total drama school moment to an embarrassed toddler flop in an instant. Um, um, ah, oh. <laughs> um. <laughs> Again, his eyes went to the two beautiful women. I think he couldn't comprehend that both of them were in the same place, both at the same time being like both and both being there. It was obviously an awkward moment, awkwardly expanded into what felt like a a beautiful infinity as nothing was said. Gabriel noisily picked non-existent lint from his armour while looking around and smiling at each of us in turn. He looked at the sky after far too long to make it, you know, sort of kosher. What was that, father? He said to no one. He took a hand to cup to his ear as if trying to hear something better. Yes, father, I will be right there. He shrugged his shoulder with an unsaid apology and disappeared with a, another ping. The light shot to the sky. Sammy smiled at his disappearance. You see? Said Sammy. She turned to Lucifer and smiled. I mean, what did we even see in him? He is a total twat at the end of the day. She told the devil. Yes. I like the word twat. The devil nodded her agreement and the two women seemed to have, I don't know, like a, a shared moment before the feeling of intense hate fell back between them again. Tell me, Will. Do you really want to know the truth beyond any shadow of a doubt? The professor asked me. I thought about it. I need to know, I replied. The professor turned to Bosworth. I think this is an appropriate juncture to call upon those wishes you promised me, old boy. He said to the pink robe. What wishes are them, then? The robe answered. Ah, you tricky old genies, eh? Huh? <laughs> Laughed the professor. You know I got you that sweet deal for transdimensional ashtrays and rubbish bins, did I not? They're utterly brilliant. You never have to empty them because the contents are dumped on another plane. Come on, Bosworth, old chap, don't try that one on me, said Simon. Hey, lad, it's part of me job to be a tricky trickster, ain't it? Be too easy if I just went, yeah, wouldn't it? But OK, then. Then may I please have the wishes as previously agreed. I'm sure there was some form of verbal contract there. Must have been. The professor asked. Aye, lad, of course you can, but remember to be clear in what you want, cos what you say is what you get. There ain't no second goals, said Bozzy. OK, then. Uh, let me think for a moment to make sure this is clear enough. Uh... Could you please tell me who took Sally and the pups, Bozzy? Yes, this is my wish. Bosworth flared a, a, an even brighter pink, sort of fiery type thing and seemed to turn into a, I don't know, a weird lava lamp for a moment, bits breaking off him and then coalescing back together as he did his magic thing. Okay, okay. It were devil that done it, he said, pointing an empty robe arm at Lucy. We all turned to Satan herself in response, and she smiled and gave us a curtsy. <laughs> 
It's a fair cop, Governor. <laughs> she said as she laughed. I... <laughs> I was raging. I took a step... A step towards her. I knew there'd be nothing I could do against her, but... I was gonna fucking try. She laughed at me. Just a little. Almost instantly dousing my internal fires. I realised that she... She had no fear of me at all, and that was a sign I should back the fuck off. A warning from Fen followed, and as I should do, I, I listened. She raised her hand towards me to reinforce the idea that I should stop. And in this case, I didn't have God's freedom of choice. I had no personal choice. This was a command, and I stopped. Okay, okay, I did it. I have to say, it wasn't easy getting rid of her, to be honest. She is a little tough nut when she digs her heels in. She wouldn't move willingly, whatever I did, so I had no choice. She stayed where she was, and I moved the universe around her. For badness's sake, that was the easier option. And thank goodness that I have nothing to do with physics. If I did, then that may have been much harder. But because I don't, I just asked nicely. And it complied. What a good universe. She explained. I now fought the spell, or whatever it was that held me, through sheer willpower and ignoring both the professor and Fenn, who were telling me not to, I started to move with hesitant steps towards her. I didn't know what I would do when I got to her, but I knew that I was going to get to her. Whoa, whoa, Will. She said. I tell you what. <laughs> do you want her and the boys back? Yes, Will. You are daddy to three boys. I'm afraid that where I put her was so far away that due to the speed of light and that stuff, they will age a little to get here. I can't help that. So you will have three teenage werewolf boys. Would that be nice of me? She asked. She turned away from us and directed her focus on a patch of spare ground just beyond Sammy. She moved her hands in some, I don't know, fucking arcane magical way as she whispered a far too guttural liturgy into the night. The word she spoke actually at my ears it was as though they were being struck by waves of pressure a small ball of flame grew where she focused it expanded and then suddenly broke out to become a vertical a large vertical ring something like 12 feet across the ring's contents were just darkness as the ring grew we could hear sound coming from inside it it there was growling and snarling and the definite sound of paws running on. <laughs> I remember now. Crisp, new snow. Then from the ring of flame, one after another burst four werewolves. The white wolf I recognised instantly as Sally. Blue eyes and a coat of pure white. The three others were smaller but deep grey with a hint of blue. I could tell they were angry as they tore into the world. Probably not enough of a word to describe the feeling that I got off them. I mean, angry. It was a lot more than angry. It was raging. No, that's not enough. Bloody livid. Well, let's just call it angry times ten. Sadly for Sammy, she was the first thing they met, and they descended on her as a pack, taking whatever frustration that had built up wherever they were out on her. The slaughter was, well, it was horrific, but at least it was brief. Sammy got halfway through a screen before she was under a pile of bodies that ripped and tore her apart. It had been, it, well, it had been very quick and savage, and the werewolves continued their butchering of the body well after Sammy's star had gone to join her sons in the firmament. We watched this, and as they finished, they turned to us. There was... No recognition in those eyes. Shit, they were out for blood. The werewolves postured as Bosworth rolled his sleeves up and Simon got ready to receive the charge that would inevitably come. Then the white werebeast seemed to relax. Those eyes met mine and 
then there was a moment of recognition. In the next brief second, there was a, a little naked Sally stood next to her white wolf soul, Azza. Tears streamed down her face as she looked at me. The other werewolves, although confused, stopped their threatening behaviour, and they looked towards their... their mother. For some reason, I still don't understand. I wanted to go to her. I ran forward and pulled Sally into my arms and held her so tightly, so tightly to my body. The emotion that flooded, flooded me was unknown. It was... It was... I don't know, but all I wanted to do was hold her and make everything all right for her in this world. I cared. This... This moment was a first. After some time... After he had given Sally and me our moment, the professor walked up to us. He unbuckled his helmet and took it off, throwing it uncaringly to the ground and smiled. Just such a beautiful smile. He smiled at us. He had tears in his eyes. This beautiful, this beautiful time had made the man shed a tear. He was a, a fucking true friend, a, a true friend, and I, I felt love from him, from both him and Sally. Life for me had changed. The professor came to me and. Hug Sally. I've heard so much about you, milady, and I can see that Will did not lie. As the very image of Aphrodite herself, you are beauty personified. Simon de Montford, sixth Earl of Leicester, and I am utterly at your service, ma'am. He turned to me and then stuck out a hand to shake. <laughs> a fucking handshake. I grabbed that hand and pulled him into a bear hug. It felt right. His mouth was right next to my ear, my mouth next to his. Oh dear. What a moment this is. I... I'm so sorry, Will. He gently said. Why sorry? I asked him. I mean, you did all this. I, I can't... I can't thank you enough, Simon, I told him. He stepped away from me now, holding my hand. I am truly sorry, Will, he said, and I, I could see that he was. He, he really was sorry. I was confused. He called over the, the glowing robe. Bosworth. I'm afraid I'm going to need that second wish, and I'm going to need it right now. He asked the giant neon genie. Aye, of course, lad, anything for you, replied the genie. The professor then turned back to me, and his eyes were on the ground. He slowly, he slowly lifted those eyes to meet mine, and turned his head to one side, and a smile just passed over his face uh, a smile of uh, I think regret Bosworth it is my wish restrain the werewolves all of them he ordered I am so so sorry Will I truly am really this is not my choice but it is my mission and I cannot, I must not permit you to, to. It is incumbent upon me to kill you. Oh, we leave on another cliffhanger. <gasps> will the professor kill Will? Will he or won't he? Will, will he? Will, will, yeah. Remember, support the show, buy us a coffee, it really helps, uh, um, we love you, you're fantastic, and all that kind of stuff, um, descriptions, read, and follow, and like, and share, and do all that stuff, yeah, bye!